a quick review of inverses, which you should have had some exposure to last year. Okay, inverses. Uh, first, talk about notation and how to uh, write inverse. And this is, unfortunately, the notation we are stuck with. If you see this, that means the inverse of f of x. Uh, now, what I hate about this, I absolutely hate this, I wish they could have come up with some different notation, is that when you see that, it looks like an exponent of negative 1. Um, the good example of this is things like inverse trig. Like, if I were going to do the inverse sine, a lot of people think that, and in their heads, they're thinking, ah, inverse sine. Or no, they don't even say inverse sine. They say, ah, sine to the negative 1, and they think, oh, anything to the negative 1 power is 1 over sine, or 1 over that. And we all know that 1 over sine is cosecant. And so people see that little negative 1 and they think it's an exponent. They treat it like an exponent and they get the inverse confused with a reciprocal. And the thing is, inverse sine is not cosecant. It is way wrong. Um, and it's, it's the notation that we're left with and we just have to deal with it. But know that this is inverse sine. It's not 1 over sine. That is inverse of f. It's not 1 over f. It's not an exponent. So just remember that if you ever see that, it's not an exponent. If I wanted to raise a function to the negative 1 power, you would have to write it like this and raise it to the negative 1 on the outside. Same way with trig functions. If I wanted to raise sine of x to the negative 1 power, I would have to write it like that. So just know that if you ever see the negative 1 kind of between the f and the x or between the trig function and the x, that's actually the notation for inverse. Um, and actually for that reason, I usually don't write inverse sign like that. I usually write it as arc sign because with that there is no confusion. You're not going to be tempted to write arc sign as 1 over sign. So uh, those are the same thing. And just know that that is the notation that we are stuck with for inverse sign or inverse whatever. All right, so there's your notation for inverse stuff. Now, moving on. Okay, how to find the inverse. Some of y'all may remember that to find an inverse, um, you swap x and y and you solve for the new y. And this is the algebraic y. So to find the inverse of this function, y equals x cubed plus 7, let's see, we would do a little loop-de-doop -loop and swap x and y. So it's going to become y, x equals y cubed plus 7. And then we play algebra. We will subtract 7, x minus 7 equals y cubed, and then finish solving the cubed root of x minus 7 is y. So this is the inverse of that one. Um, f of x equaling the square root of x minus 9. Remember, f of x, you could treat that like a y. We've talked about that. So if I swap the x and the y, that becomes x equals the square root of y minus 9. And then we'll solve the equation. We'll square both sides x squared equals y minus 9, and then you get x squared minus 9 is equal to y, and that is our inverse for the square root of x minus 9. Um, <clears throat> so there we go. Find an inverse algebraically. You could also find an inverse graphically. Um, if you're looking at a graph versus an equation, now, I, I know I gave you an equation, but we'll just kind of work with it. The inverse of a function is the reflection of the graph across the line y equals x. So I gave you a function here, y equals ln x. So I'm going to sketch the graph of ln x real quick. And then we will graph the inverse of ln x. Uh, let's see, ln x, I know it goes through the point 1, 0. We talked about that in class today. Um, we have a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. So let me draw a vertical asymptote in here. Vertical asymptote. And then I also know it goes through the point E1, and we learned that E is 2.718281828459045523. So there's about E. And when I draw ln of x, this is what the graph of ln x looks like. If I want to graph its inverse, then what I'll do is I'll draw the line y equals x. There's the line y equals x. And we will reflect ln x across that line to get the inverse. So that's y equals ln x. Okay, the inverse, I'm going to move all of those points straight across the x-axis. So this point, which was 1, 0, is going to move, not the x-axis, is going to move across y equals x, 
is going to end up at 0, 1. The point E1, 2.71, when I've moved that over, it's going to move about to there. Uh, my vertical asymptote, if you reflect a vertical asymptote across y equals x, it's actually going to turn into a horizontal asymptote. So the inverse is going to have a horizontal asymptote. It's going to go through those two points, um, and it's going to end up looking like this. It's going to come up at that point, and hopefully that looks familiar. What does that look like? What does that look like? Anybody? 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 That's right. It's e to the x. Um, and e to the x and l and x are inverses of each other. And if you think about that algebraically, let's go into algebra land here. If I have y equals l and x, if I want to find its inverse, I would swap the x and the y and turn it into x equals the ln of y. So now I'm trying to find the inverse. We swapped the x's and y's. And now I solve for y and the way we isolate y there is we raise both sides to the e power and you get e to the x is equal to y, and therefore those are inverses of each other. Those are inverses of each other. So y equals ln x, and e to the x equals y. Uh, any questions there? No? Wait, good. So those are inverses. When you reflected them, they looked like inverses, and there we go. Let's see, time. Six minutes, not too bad. Okay, um, a few other things with inverses. So we just talked about the graphs are reflections across y equals x. You get them algebraically by swapping x and y and solving. Uh, a couple of other facts. Uh, this first one is pretty important. Um, if, if, you have, yeah, if you have f and its inverse, if you do the composition f inverse of f, you will always get x. And this other one, whoops, I forgot the rest of it. And f of f inverse is always equal to x. That's always going to be true. That's what inverses are. Um, another thing, the domain of f is the range of f inverse, and the domain of f inverse is the range of f. And if you think about it, when you swap x and y, that's why they, it works out that way. Um, so the domain, the x's of f of x, are the same thing as the range of f inverse because you swap the x's and y's to get the inverse. Um, Let's look at this first fact up here. I want to go back to the first page, or not the first page. I want to go back to here, this one. Okay, when I saw we had y equals x cubed plus 7, and the cubed root of x minus 7 equals y, those were inverses. So let's look at those two, except I'm not, whoops, too far. Here we go. Um, so looking at number 1, this number 1 up here, we had y equals x cubed plus 7, and I'm going to call that f of x, which is the same thing. So we had x cubed plus 7, and we found out that the inverse of that was the cube root of x minus 7. And I want to show you what I mean by this first little piece of information. If I were to do f of f inverse, or the other way around, it really doesn't matter which one's on the outside, that's going to be the same thing as f of, and f inverse was the cube root of x minus 7. So I simply plugged in the inverse right there. And then f of that means we will take out the x in the f graph, and in its place we will plug in the cube root of x minus 7. So I will have the cube root of x minus 7, all cubed, plus 7, and we clean that up. The cube root cubed becomes just x minus 7 plus 7, and x minus 7 plus 7 is x. And I knew that was going to be the right answer because by definition, if you have inverses, f of f inverse always equals x. f inverse of f always equals x. Um, so the, there's your basic test for inverses. If you want to know two things are inverses, you plug one function into the other and see if you get x for an answer. Um, so, uh, let's see, slightly tougher problems. Uh, I'm giving you a table. This table is for f of x, and I want you to find f inverse of 3. Uh, let's see, so if we're going to find f inverse of 3, and a lot of y'all are gonna, not going to like this because you don't have an equation. We talk about this all the time. Some of y'all are just lovers of equations. I need f inverse of 3. I'm going to show you what's wrong, what not to do, and this is dangerous. 
the F inverse of 3, and this is because of this stupid notation. People see that inverse notation, and they're thinking reciprocals. So they say, okay, well, let's see. F of 3 is 5. And I can see that in the table. When X is 3, F of X is 5. And so people think, oh, well, then F inverse, whoops, that's supposed to be 3 here. Let's say I'll fix that there. All right. Um, so F inverse of 3 must be, must be 1 fifth because, hey, you just put it 1 over. Wrong. Do not do that. That is wrong. That is wrong. That is wrong. You do not simply flip. Inverse and reciprocal is not synonymous. And I kind of wish that algebra teachers didn't use them that way. Uh, when we're talking about functions, the inverse, now remember, if it's an inverse, that's an x for my inverse. That means y equals 3 for my function. So if I'm plugging 3 into my inverse, that means my 3 was the y for my original function because we swapped x and y. So what I have to do to answer this problem is I have to look at my y coordinates, which is the same thing as f, and here is where I got my 3. So I know that f of 1 is 3, which means the ordered pair 1, 3 belongs to f of x. Well, that means the ordered pair 3, 1 is in f inverse, which means f inverse of 3 is equal to 1. So there's the answer. So if I want, if I ask for f inverse of something, that means that value, in this case 3, was a y coordinate for my original function. Uh, another slightly difficult problem. Uh, same type thing, except here I gave you an equation, and I'm asking you to find f inverse of 2. Now here is where some of y'all are going to not like this one. Because you're going to first try to solve for the inverse. You're going to swap x and y, so to find the inverse, here's what you're thinking. We're going to change that to x equals y cubed minus y squared plus 4. And then you're going to try to solve for y to get the, the inverse's equation. You're not going to be able to solve this for y. There is some long, cumbersome cubic equation, kind of like the quadratic equation. I don't know it. And you're not going to be able to factor. There's no way you're going to solve this for y uh, that I'm aware of. So we kind of poop out right here. This doesn't quite work. So here we are. We're struggling with what to do here. Uh, and so here's what we're going to do here. Scott, you're not going to like this, but remember that if x is 2 in my inverse, that means y equals 2 for f of x. So what I've really got to determine is, and this is my thinking land here, what I've really got to find out is when does f of x equal to? That's what we've got to find out. If I can answer that question, then I'll know what f inverse of 2, because it's going to be the x value. I just need to find out, okay, well, if x equals whatever x it takes for x to give me a function value of 2. Um, so you may be thinking, oh, well, then why don't we just do this? Let's do x cubed minus x squared plus 4 equals 2. And see if we can solve that. Again, you're going to run into some trouble because that doesn't factor. Now, you might be able to go into the rational root theorem if you remember that. But what we're going to do, and any math teacher or math professor who happens to stumble upon this video is about to cringe. They, they may send me some hate mail. And I know the Math League of America is going to plot my demise after they see this. But we are simply going to guess. And when we guess, we're going to guess the three sexiest numbers in the world. Zero, one, and negative 1, and we're going to hope that one of those three works. So if I plug in 0, 0 cubed minus 0 squared plus 4 equals 2. No, that didn't work, so forget that. Okay, let's try 1. 1 cubed minus 1 squared plus 4 equals 2. Now, again, that doesn't work. 1 minus 1 plus 4 is not equal to 2, so let's try negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1 minus negative 1 squared is 1 plus 4, negative 1, minus 1, plus 4 is 2. Uh, hey, that works. Since that worked, and negative 1 is the x value that gave me 2, I know that f inverse of 2 is equal to 1, and there's the answer. And I know that's very sketchy, that's very fuzzy, and you're probably thinking, oh, well, what if the answer is 3, or what if the answer is 17? On a problem like this, I'm not going to make it something so outlandish that you wouldn't guess it.
I might make it two, but I'm not going to go any further than two or negative two. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because it's shown up on the AP exam, and I'm teaching this as it may, as you may encounter it on the AP exam. The AP people are not going to expect you to guess two thirds or something bizarre like that. So let's guess zero, one, or negative one. It'll be one of those three if you can't find it in a more traditional algebraic technique. So there that goes. This video got a little bit longer than usual, but that's it. Um, we will see you in class Monday. Have a great weekend. Or Sunday night, because you're probably watching it. No, never mind. You're watching this during AO, aren't you? Y'all are watching this video during AO on Monday, right before you come into class. Good job. I'll see you in a few minutes.